Item Number SCP-6042 Level 1 Unrestricted Containment Class Euclid Disruption Class Vlam Risk Class Caution Special Containment Procedures All Foundation personnel must be aware of SCP-6042's existence and nature. Any personnel affected by SCP-6042, henceforth referred to as SCP-6042-A, must immediately contact Hotline 6042 in order to prevent any unnecessary investigation of their disappearance. SCP-6042-A instances must walk through a hinged door within 15 minutes of noticing SCP-6042's effects. Any SCP-6042-A instances exiting SCP-6042 must be submitted to a psychological evaluation to assess if they are fully relieved from SCP-6042's effects and can be returned to Foundation duty. Any personnel suffering from Late Entry Syndrome must be terminated. Description: SCP-6042 is a 6x4 meter cabin located in a pocket dimension resembling a boreal forest. The cabin's furniture includes a bed, a table, a chair, a fireplace, and a shelf stacked with several unlabeled tin cans. Following a not yet understood pattern, SCP-6042 will affect a single member of Foundation personnel. Footnote 1. This pattern was, at first, thought to be random, but over time SCP-6042 has affected high-ranking personnel, particularly researchers, more frequently. Footnote 2. No SCP-6042-A instances have ever been observed outside of Foundation personnel. SCP-6042-A will see any open hinged door as leading inside SCP-6042 and feel compelled to walk through. That feeling will intensify over the course of approximately 75 minutes after SCP-6042-A becomes aware of SCP-6042's effects. If the 75-minute limit is reached, SCP-6042-A will become totally obsessed by the idea of walking through a door and rush towards any they see. At this stage, SCP-6042-A is no longer capable of coherent speech, or even actions as basic as drinking or eating. SCP-6042-A will remain in that state until crossing a door or expiring. Once SCP-6042-A walks through a door, they will enter the pocket dimension, and won't be able to leave or contact the exterior for a period varying between 13 minutes and 23 hours. During that period, SCP-6042-A will engage in activities associated with vacations in a forest cabin, such as fishing, wood whittling, bird watching, or skipping stones. SCP-6042-A will be entirely focused on these activities, and won't leave the vicinity of the cabin, even if ordered to do so before entry. After that period, the door of SCP-6042 will lead SCP-6042-A back to the point of entry. After exiting SCP-6042, SCP-6042-A instances will retain a vague memory of the period spent in the pocket dimension. Affected personnel with an entry time above 75 minutes will, in 100% of cases, suffer from Late Entry Syndrome, an obsession for doors growing in intensity after their return from SCP-6042. Over the span of a few days, they will return to the stage where they frantically run through every door they see without being able to enter SCP-6042 again, until they expire or are terminated. Footnote 3 Amnestics have been proven ineffective to cure personnel in this condition. Late Entry Syndrome has also been observed, although very rarely, in cases with time of entry below 75 minutes, down to a minimum of 17 minutes. Under 10 minutes after SCP-6042-A leaves SCP-6042 or expires before entry, another member of Foundation personnel will be affected by SCP-6042. Addendum 6042-1 Level 3 Clearance Required Credentials Accepted Addendum 6042-1 On 19 Dr. Nassar was affected by SCP-6042. He left SCP-6042 after 6 days. On 19 
A study of his case was opened under the direction of Dr. Hertzen, lead researcher on SCP-6042, in order to gather information about his abnormally long stay. On 19, Dr. Hertzen was authorized to interview Dr. Nassar using Compound ATA-02. Footnote 4. Compound ATA-02 is an anti-amnestic and disinhibitor used to access erased and subconscious memories. While the interview did not bring up new information regarding SCP-6042, several erased memories revealed Dr. Nassar to be a sleeper agent from GOI Alpha-19, Serpent's Hand. He was unconscious of his sleeper agent status due to heavy mind alterations, supposedly realized to facilitate his infiltration. Dr. Nassar was supposed to be activated alongside other sleeper agents in a coordinated attack against the Foundation. Warning. The following section of this document is restricted to the O5 Council and authorized personnel only. Enter credentials. Credentials accepted. Addendum 6042-2 On January 16th, 2021, Dr. Olliser was affected by SCP-6042. When he left SCP-6042 19 hours later, a cell phone of a non-existing brand and an unlabeled journal were found on his person. These objects were not in his possession when he entered SCP-6042, and he claims to have no memory of how he acquired them. The following is a picture found on the cell phone, believed to be an outside view of SCP-6042. The following is a transcription of logs written by hand found in the journal. Dr. Headley writing. According to my phone, it's been seven days since I entered SCP-6042. If I remember the file correctly, it's the longest stay ever recorded. And I also know that I shouldn't even be able to write under SCP-6042's usual effects. In fact, I'm not sure of what effects it still has on me. I still feel a strong urge to whittle and fish, but can resist it now. I usually like this kind of stuff, but being somewhat forced to do it takes the pleasure out of it. Also, I can tell that I know this place, but I don't remember where from. The door of the cabin doesn't lead back to our reality yet, and since I'm the first one to get the opportunity, I'm going to explore the place. I found this journal under the bed, inside a backpack full of hiking gear, and the cabin shelf is stacked with tin food, so preparing for an expedition won't be a problem. I used the last percent of my phone's battery to take a picture of the cabin, but it'll be the only one, since I don't think I'll find any electricity here. I'm going to sleep on that, and I'll be on my way at dawn. Day 8. I remember now. This place is from my youth. I used to spend most of my summers here as a child. At least I think I did. This is really weird. It feels like a memory I always had but at the same time was hidden deep inside my brain before today. It might be another mind alteration effect of SCP-6042. Anyway, my cabin's door still only opens on that forest, so all I can do for now is focus on the exploration. I remember an easily climbable tree on top of a hill beyond the river. Getting an overhead view would be a good start. The hill and the tree are both there, and I have proof now that this is a pocket dimension, not just a distant location. I'd say the forest stretches to the horizon, but there doesn't seem to be one. Instead, the trees just keep going forever. It's a very disturbing sight, but the weirdest thing about the view is the area around the cabin is repeating itself. What I mean is, I can see roughly every 10 kilometers the exact same hill and tree I'm standing on right now, in every direction. This is true for all landmarks, like the river or that clearing below me, with only one exception. A mountain, at least 2 kilometers tall, about 100 kilometers from here. It's also a recurring landmark, but only appears every 200 kilometers or so, though it's very hard to get a precise estimation of such distances. There also is a pale beam of light originating from each peak and shooting up into the sky. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't know what that is, but I'll try to find out by climbing the nearest summit. The terrain is really rough, and I'm not that young anymore. It'll be a long walk. Day 9. I think that beam of light is way more than a simple bunch of excited photons. I slept next to the clearing and had a clear view of that thing last night. It was mesmerizing, 
like a lava fall piercing through the clouds to infiltrate into the top of the mountain. I experienced strange feelings after a few minutes of observation. It was like... I don't really know how to explain it. I, I felt connected to it. I walked along the river and soon found another cabin. The entire roof is missing, as are most of the walls. The interior is utterly destroyed, and I believe there has been an explosion inside, the origin probably being the door itself. What's making me believe that is on one hand the way the debris is laid out, and on the other hand, the skeleton embedded in what's left of the wall in front of the entrance. I don't know how fast that poor guy went through, but it sure as hell was a quick death. There were still some remnants of a white coat on him, bearing the Foundation logo, and I found an ID badge for Dr. Zyker Skiliterapon, a level 4 researcher at Site 111. This doesn't ring any bells though, which is weird because I happen to have worked at Site 111 for most of my career, so I suppose I would remember about such a weird name, or at least have heard of personnel disappearing in such a violent explosion. Day 10. New Day, New Cabin. This one was intact. In fact, it was even inhabited. It was nice to encounter another living human, but he was entirely subjugated to SCP-6042's effects. Now that I saw what it looks like from an outside perspective, I understand why nobody was ever able to explore this place. The guy was fishing when I arrived, quite a silly sight given he was knee-deep in the river while wearing a three-piece suit. Nothing could have distracted him. I tried talking to him, pushing, even punching him. He didn't even look at me. I also tried grabbing his fishing rod and throwing it in the river. He didn't seem to understand what had happened, and after a few seconds shouted, Did a fucking fish steal me fishing rod? with a thick northern English accent. I found a badge in his pocket, with everything written in a gothic font. His name is Gregory Ward, and he is a superior spook at the SCO Foundation, the anagram standing for Search and Containment of the Obscure. His cabin is exactly identical to mine, with the same unmarked tin cans and hiking gear. When I think about it, these cabins are very… Um, generic. There isn't any characteristic detail on the furniture. An explanation could be that different cabins are linked to different timelines or dimensions. The generic style could be used to correspond to all of them, implying all those dimensions have a common denominator. I still have no idea how this place came to be but this almost seems like a conscious design decision. Day 11. I found another destroyed cabin. Unlike the other one, only aging caused the damage, but there was still a corpse. It was way fresher though, and this guy had a way slower death than the last one. His right forearm was torn open, presumably before he entered this cabin because there's a blood trail starting from the door. When I say torn open, I mean the skin was first cut lengthwise and then pulled on both sides of his arm to peel it open. I've already seen some gruesome things, but I was never involved in the cleanup and by god the smell is horrible. He was in a weird foundation uniform, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't a D-class. Also, there was a folder next to him labeled Project Midwinter. I'll check what this is about. Maybe it'll explain what happened to him. Holy fuck. Well, there's good news and bad news. Good ones first. Yesterday's theory seems correct. These cabins are gateways from different timelines or versions of our reality. Bad news is, things aren't going well in some of these realities. If I understand correctly, the idea behind that Project Midwinter was to create an anomaly to wipe out all anomalies. Sounds nice, but obviously too good to be true. Apparently, it resulted in some kind of anomalous snow that makes you obsessed with it if looked at for too long. In the long run, you end up sacrificing yourself to it, and your corpse turns into the same snow. That wonderful foundation project led to a CK class. It's mentioned that extreme pain reduces the effects of the snow, so that poor guy might have did that to himself before being affected by SCP-6042. On the bright side, the project eliminated almost all known SCPs, but the file says that 6042 was one of the last remaining until there was no one left to send here, I guess. If someone's reading this, you must be wondering what kind of moron thought this was a good idea, right? Well, I know. It's written on the first page. Lead Researcher, Dr. Raymond Headley. 
Day 12. Today's cabin wasn't destroyed. It would have been better if it was. As I was approaching, I first noticed something weird about the sound of the river. When I looked, it took me a few seconds to understand what I saw. The river was flowing backwards, and very fast. In fact, everything was reversed. Leaves were falling upward, birds were flying tail first. It looked like the world around me was a VHS tape on rewind. As I arrived at the cabin after a few minutes, everything returned to normal, like a switch had been flipped. It's probably 6042's way to prepare for a new guest. Said guest wasn't long to arrive. When the cabin's door opened, someone emerged in an intense wave of heat, then collapsed to the floor. The cabin immediately catched fire, so I ran to get him out. He was burned so heavily that his acrylic clothes had fused with his skin. When he saw me, he was shocked for a second, then threw me the angriest gaze I have ever seen. In a tremendous effort, he used his last breath to utter five words. RMD failed. Your fault, Headley. What is this place? Who am I? I know what an RMD is. I know it because I'm the inventor of the Relative Mass Dissipator. It's a key component of Project Leashed Star, my project. The point is to create a miniature star and harvest its energy via a Dyson Sphere. The star must have a mass sufficient to permit nuclear fusion, but the RMD contains the gravitational effects inside the star's enclosure, and also prevents it from expanding. The RMD cannot fail. I spent a decade conceiving it and another one testing it. Not once did this wonderful machine fail. Not. Once. But if it did fail in that guy's reality, he must have entered SCP-6042 the exact instant the star breached its enclosure, because the following instant a sun appeared on the surface of the Earth. I hope that other Headley was just a dumb fuck who created a shitty version of my invention. We were starting the reaction when I left, and everything was going well. But maybe it also started well for them. There's no way to know how long it took for the RMD to fail. I need to go back. I have to stop this thing before it's too late. I'm heading to my cabin, in hope that the door is now leading back to our reality. If it is the case, I might end up in a cell for the rest of my life, but at least my world will be saved. But if it's not the case, God, if there is a god here, please let me go back. Nothing. There is nothing left of my cabin but ashes. Why? Why did I get affected at the worst possible time, one hour after we started the reaction? Had I went in one hour sooner, they would have waited for my return to test this fucking machine. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I came back here as fast as I could. I only took one break when I wrote the last entry. I wrote for whom? Everyone is dead now. Who needs a stupid exploration log when there's nothing left to contain and no one left to protect? I didn't even find a body in the rubble. I don't know why the door opened if nothing but heat crossed it. Maybe it wanted to show me what I've done. Or is it just a way to remember what happened to my now deceased world? I don't know how much time I spent here, staring at a pile of ashes. I thought about killing myself. A lot. But when I look at that beam of light, I feel warmth, hope, like a friend is suddenly comforting me. Since I have nowhere else to go, I'm back to the original plan of finding out what that thing is. At least it'll keep my mind busy. I've been avoiding the cabins on my way to the mountain, but my supplies were running low so I had to come to this one. While approaching, I noticed it was empty, but not destroyed, and suspected there might be something special about it. Well, I can't say I was disappointed, but I certainly wasn't pleased. Inside there were dozens of files some written by hand, with my handwriting. There was also a note on the table. I'm leaving everything I gathered here before going to the light. If you are reading, you probably did all this. I did it too. Each folder is about a different project. Project Nightfall, Project Winter Contingency, Project Broken Arrow. Every time it's a brilliant idea on paper. Every time it backfires horribly. Every time, it's about how Raymond Headley caused the end of a world. All that guilt. I want to make it go away, but the light won't let me. It's calling me. It needs me. He can't talk, but I understand. 
We are the offspring of the saboteur, sent across the multiverse to destroy the foundations and the worlds they protect. The cabin never existed. It's just a fake memory, the keystone of our personality. We were successful in our mission, but eventually one of us was freed from our curse and thrived. He scoured the dimensions to see what we were, what he had been. He tried to warn everyone about Raymond Headley, but when his mind touched the infinity, he thrived even further away, too far to speak or see like before. Now he can only feel the foundations and the others. Now he can only speak to himself. He created this place to catch us, to catch me. As we become one with him, he is gaining his sight back. As he sees more clearly, he improves the door. I am Death, the destroyer of worlds. I will be the creator. I know who I am now. I remember touching the light yesterday, but everything after that is a blur. Thankfully, it looks like I was conscious enough to write down what was going through my mind. I know why I decided to wait before joining the creator. I realize it's futile, but after I'm gone, the last remaining proof my world ever existed will be this journal and my phone, and I want someone to remember after I'm gone. I pass by an inhabited cabin on my way here. I'll leave all this in the pockets of the guest. Find Raymond Headley. Cancel all his projects and put him in a cell. If he is ever chosen by the door, let him come here to help us. The creator can't warn everyone yet, but at least I can warn you. That's it for today everyone, thank you so much for watching and a huge thank you to all of my patrons on Patreon. Special shout out to my level 4 patrons, Alexis Zagrate, Lesby Friends, Scrubversive, Deja Shade, and Max Loves Ears. If you would like to see your name at the end of my videos, see my videos early, and get some other cool perks, head on over to patreon.com slash drmaxwell, link in the description.